Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Radio's outstanding theater of thrill, Suspense, an episode from the year I was born, May 15th, 1956. Paula Winslow stars in this episode called The Death Parade. And now, to a nice presentation of Radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, we bring you a transcribed story of a woman who finds a letter warning of death and has only three hours to deliver it. We call it the Death Parade. So now, starring Paula Winslow, here is tonight's suspense play, The Death Parade. and talk about this, huh? Now, this girl fell or was pushed off a roof this morning, and you say you were the only other person there at the time? Well, I was. I told you. Oh, oh, what do you mean, pushed? You, you mean you think that I... Oh, how can you? How I can know you're you? upset, but will you just take it easy and try upset? to answer... Upset? The... I'm nearly out of my mind. I don't see how you can expect me to tell you anything. First you accuse me, and now you... Oh, how can you policemen be so unfeeling? All I was trying to do was... Oh, it's, it's freezing in here. You've uh, no here, right to... Miss Johnson. Try some of this coffee. It'll make you feel better. Now, you've told us you know something about this accident, something more than we already know. Yes. Yes, I do, Lieutenant. I mean, it, it never would have happened. Don't you see? Sure, sure. Now, come on, drink this. This will help me. Oh, I, I, I'm so nervous. Oh, it's... Well, that, that's all right. That's all right. We'll clean it up later. Well, that's how it started. You know, you see? That's how it started this morning. Just like that. The coffee. That poor girl wouldn't have died if the coffee hadn't spilled. That's just how it started. My name's Ellen Johnson. I work at the Farnsworth Chemical Plant. For 12 years, I've been there and never missed an hour of work. That is, until today. It was so unnecessary. That horrible, rude little man. He was the one. I'm very precise about my daily habits. Very. When you live alone, you arrange things that way. In the morning, I arise and allow myself time to take coffee and toast at the cafe on my corner. I've always disliked cooking in the morning. I leave the cafe at 8.15 precisely in order to be at my desk exactly at 9. This morning was the same. Just the same, except for that horrible man. He was awful. As I sat at the counter, I could feel him there, two seats away, thin and dark, making a nasty noise as he drank his coffee. It was all his fault. Gonna see the parade this afternoon, miss? Oh, no, no, I'm afraid I'll be working. That's too bad. Should be good for business. Yes, I imagine so. Anything else? Hey. Hey, you. Oh, no, thank you. It's uh, 25. Uh, coffee and toast, is it right? Yes. Thanks. Hey, you. Pass the sugar, will you? Good morning. See you tomorrow. What's the matter? I asked for the sugar. You can't pass it? I beg your pardon. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh! Oh! Why, look at that! You you deliberately spilled that coffee all over my skirt. Uh, oh, gee. Gee, you... ain't that a shame. What a clumsy. Gee, am I sorry. He wasn't. He wasn't in the least sorry. 
He'd done it on purpose, on purpose. I was wearing a gray silk dress, and it was probably ruined. He just stood there and wiped at the stain with his napkin, smiling. Dirty, crooked teeth. I pushed him away and walked out. I knew I was going to be late because I had to change, so I went home again. If I hadn't gone home, this awful thing might never have happened. It took me 15 minutes to get back to the apartment, change my dress, and leave again for the office. I'd walked three blocks when I saw the letter. It was lying on the pavement in front of an apartment house. Because I'm very meticulous about my filing in the office, I can't bear things to be out of place. I suppose that's why I picked it up. It was unsealed and addressed simply to Miss Sheila Mannix. No house number or street. Uh, dear Sheila Mannix, you don't know me. I just got into the city. It doesn't matter who I am, but this is a warning. Believe me, you better take notice. Jack's got it in for you. Oh, I stopped reading. There was more, but I didn't want to go on. It uh, frightened me a little, and... Well, I'm not one to pry into other people's business. But this... This wasn't prying, really. It wasn't. The letter was important. Whoever had written it must have forgotten to put the address on it, and it had fallen out of their pocket. I made up my mind then. I'd go into the apartment house. It was possible that the writer lived there, and on his way out had dropped it. The building was quite small, and the janitor probably knew his tenant's handwriting. Let me see, janitor. Janitor. Oh. Yeah? Oh, uh, are you the janitor? Yeah, I'm sorry. We got no vacancies. Oh, no, no, I don't. Uh, uh, look, uh, this letter, it's not addressed. Uh, do you know the handwriting? I thought maybe Nobody you Nobody had... by that name living here. I, I didn't ask you that. All I want you to do is to tell me if you recognize the handwriting. It might belong to someone living here. How come you opened it? Well, it was lying on the pavement outside. She'll give it to the mailman. But it's important. I, I mean, what's in the letter. I, I think she ought to get it. So the post office will forward it. Oh, can't you see there's no address? How can they forward it? How stupid. Listen, you don't have to get nasty. I got enough trouble now. I told you she don't live here no more. Oh, I I'm sorry. Wait, wait, who doesn't live here anymore? Mannix. She had 2A about six months ago. Sheila Mannix lived here. Well, where did she move to? Can you tell me? No forwarding address. But I must find her. Sorry, lady, I can't help you. I thought of the police then. I should have told them about the letter, but I didn't. I, I didn't know what else was in it then. All I could think of at that moment was finding Sheila Mannix and giving her the letter and forgetting it. I went back to my own apartment and looked through the telephone book. There were two Sheila Mannixes listed. The first lived on Maple Street and the second on South Tower. I rang the Maple number first. Hello? Oh, uh, hello. Is, is this Miss Sheila Mannix speaking? Oh, Mrs. Sheila Mannix? Who's this? Well, my name is Ellen Johnson, and, and I found a letter this morning addressed to a Sheila Mannix. I, I thought it was important, and I wanted to make sure it got to the right party. Well, who's it from? Uh, well, that's it, you see. I, I don't know. Have you opened it? Well, yes, but I, <laughs> I only read a few lines. Oh. Uh, do you know someone named Jack... Jack, well, yes, I do have a nephew. Oh, then well, perhaps... Well, but he's in Colorado, though. It, uh, it seems to be some sort of a warning. Warning? <laughs> I'm afraid I don't understand. The, the letter says that, uh, Jack has got it in for you. It's a, uh, well, a, a, a warning. Well, I'm afraid the letter isn't for me because, you see, my Jack is only ten years old. Oh, oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry to have troubled you. Oh, it's all right. Bye. As I hung up, I realized that the Sheila Mannix I was looking for might not even have a telephone. She might not even be living in the city any longer. I looked at my watch. Oh, nine o'clock. There was my job, but... The second Sheila Mannix listed in the directory lived on South Tower. I dialed the number, then got the letter out of my purse and read it. This time, I read all of it. 
Dear Sheila Mannix, don't know me. I just got into the city. Who I am. So, warning. <laughs> Believe me, you better take notice. Jack's got it in for you. He was drunk one night, told me about it. Somebody you knew pretty well died last year. He didn't fall off that building. He was pushed, and Jack did it. Said he was going to get you, too. Oh, dear. I would have told the police, but they'd start to get nosy about me. Jack's on his way here, and from the way he talks, he'd better not find you around. He talked crazy about a parade. The corner of Maine and Thomas at 12 o'clock. That's when he's going to do it. A friend. I sat there, holding a piece of paper that carried a death warning for a woman I'd never seen. And I knew where and when she was going to be killed. You are listening to The Death Parade, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. I think you can tell from the production that this uh, Paula Winslow-helmed episode of Suspense originally was broadcast with a different lead. We'll tell you about that when Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox continues. May 15th, 1956, Suspense. I mentioned before the break that the Death Parade was originally broadcast earlier in the Suspense series on February 15th, 1951. Uh, it was written by TV screenwriter Shirley Gordon, adapted by Anthony Ellis, and uh, Agnes Moorhead starred in that original production, along with Joseph Kearns, Jerry Hausner, Brian Kane, uh, Byron Kane, uh, Lou Krugman, Jack Crucian, Lou Merrill, and Jay Novello. Now, um, as we mentioned, the uh, uh, this episode uh, it was broadcast May fifteenth, nineteen fifty six, and you'll notice a lot of different voices. Jack Crucian's in there again, but. Howard McNear, Jack Carroll, Virginia Eiler, Frank Gerstel, Stacey Harris, Helen Cleve, Clayton Post, and George Walsh. Now, more of Suspense. May 15th, 1956, The Death Parade. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Paula Winslow, starring in tonight's production, The Death Parade, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The second Sheila Mannix's address was 317 South Tower Street. I got my car out and drove there. It must have been nearly a quarter to ten when I drew up outside. It was an old rooming house. Oh, hurry up. Come on. Yeah? What do you want? Well, I'm very sorry to trouble you. Is, uh, is your name yeah, Sheila... talk louder. I can't hear you. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I wonder if you could tell me, is your name Sheila Mannix? No. Oh, no, it's not. But the phone, the, the phone book has a Sheila Mannix listed at this address. Well, it's her phone. She pays for it. I never have no cause to use it. She does live here, then? She has a room upstairs. What's the matter? Are you the police? Oh, no, no. Well, does she work? Is she at work now? How should I know? I never ask her where she goes. What's she done? You mean you don't know? You don't know where she works? Well, but do you know where she lived before she moved here? No, she never says nothing. She's quiet and keeps to herself. Oh. But where can I find her? It's important that I learn where she is right away. She'll be home prompt by seven, always is. Come back then if you got to see her. Oh, but seven will be too late. I've got to find her now before 12. There ain't no use shouting at me, miss. I can't tell you no more than I have already. Don't know nothing about Sheila Mannix. I knew I'd wasted far too much time. I had to call the police. There was a drugstore on the corner, and I ran down the block to it. I was terribly afraid, and, and even more, there, there was a feeling that the house I'd just left was the home of the woman I couldn't find. 
Good morning. Can I help you? Oh, yes, yes. Do you have a phone? There's one over there, but it's out of order. Oh, well, could I use yours? It's an emergency. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have a Well, I've got phone. to call the police. Now, oh, look, I, I've never been mixed up in anything like this before. It's... Well, it's a letter I found this morning, a warning about somebody being killed. Oh, say, that sounds bad. There's a phone in the next door. Use that. Well, maybe you know her. She lives down the block. Well, who's that? Sheila Mannix. She's the one, at least I think so. Mannix? Oh, yes, Mannix. Yes, she comes in often to have a prescription filled. Oh. Very nice young woman. Well, but do you know anything about her? I mean, where she works? I've got to find her right away. Well, no, now, I please, don't... it's urgent. I asked her landlady, and she didn't know. Well, it seems to me she did mention it once. Well, think. You, you must think. Now, please. Well, now, wait a minute. It was just the other day. We were chatting while I filled her prescription. Let me see. She said something about it. Was it a restaurant? A uh, cashier, maybe? Uh, no, no. A, a department no, no. store? Elevator operator? No. Uh, oh, dear. Uh, hats? Clothes? Uh, no, Shoes? I don't think so. uh, an usher? Telephone operator? No, no, that doesn't hit some. I'm oh, you're sorry. not thinking. Now try. Well, listen, ma'am, if I could help you, I would. Oh, you, I... well, has she any friends in the neighborhood? Uh, somebody who might know? Oh, never mentioned them. <clears throat> Can't you remember? Maybe she worked in an office. <sighs> Well... Oh, I'm sorry. I'll be with you in just a minute, sir. Excuse me a moment. There's a customer there. You better go next door and call the but police. But can't you remember? I'll be back. Uh, maybe a chorus girl. But, but does she work in a bookstore? Oh, I can't wait. I I'll come back after I've called. Uh, Ma'am, wait a minute. Yes? I, I remember. Oh. You said, you said bookstore. Yes. Right? It's yeah. a book company or something like that. Uh, Simmons. That was it. Simmons Book and Stationery Corporation. That's... That was it. Simmons Thank you. Book Thank you. It's on Main. Yes, I know the yeah. place. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... Simmons Book and Stationery Company. Why, I'd been in there dozens of times. She might even have waited on me. I looked at my watch. 10.30. I, I really meant to call the police, but I, I didn't know how long it would take to explain. And... Even then, they might not investigate without seeing the letter first. I thought of the corner of Maine and Thomas and the parade and 12 o'clock, an hour and a half. I ran to my car. I knew that once I found Sheila Mannix and gave her the warning, she'd be safe. There was a lot of traffic. It took me nearly half an hour to get to the Simmons Book and Stationery Company. The clock outside showed four minutes to 11. Good morning. May I help you? Oh, yes, yes, please. I'd like to speak to Miss Mannix, Miss Sheila Mannix. I understand that she works here. I'm very sorry, ma'am, but Miss Mannix had an appointment. Oh, she's with... not here? Well, I'm sorry, but... But where did she to... go? I think to the doctor. Well, what doctor? Where? Now, when did, when did she leave? Well, now, if you'll wait here, I'll find out for you. Oh, I could have cried. And that silly, precious little salesman, he took forever. How long does it take to get an address? I started to walk to the back of the store when he came down the aisle toward me. Sorry to have taken so long, a customer on the phone, you know. It's all right, it's all right, I don't care. Just give me that doctor's address. Why, yes, I, I have it right here. Uh, Dr. Morton, 101 Flower. 101 Flower, Dr. Morton. When did she leave? Oh, I, I forgot to ask. Oh, no, you... no, I'm going there now. Now, oh, look, listen, yes. if she comes back, if I miss her, yes. you tell her to stay right here. Yes. You understand? That don't, don't let her leave the store again until I come back. No. Don't let her leave. It's a matter of life and death. Oh, well, all right. Uh, is something wrong? Something wrong. I ran to the telephone booth. I knew I'd done as much as I could alone to save that poor girl. Police Department, Sergeant Leonard. Uh, police. Now listen. Please listen carefully. There's a murder going to be committed at 12 o'clock. Who is it? Oh, what does it matter? My name is Ellen Johnson. Please, I... I found a letter in the street this morning. It was to a woman called Mannix, a Sheila Mannix... Would you spell that, please? Oh, Mannix. M-A-N-N-I-X. There's not time for me. When did you find the letter? I told you this morning. What difference does it make? Oh, it was nine, I think. Well, why didn't you call earlier? Well, I didn't. I tried to find her myself. I think I know where she is now. Have you got the letter with you? But yes, yes. Or would you read it, please? Oh, there isn't time. You've got to send some men here. It's a warning. Somebody called Jack is going to kill her at 12 o'clock on the corner of Maine and Thomas. There's a parade going on then. Now, uh, what does this woman look oh. like? Can you give us a description? No, no, I've never seen her. I don't even know her. Uh, you say you think you know where she is. Yes, yes, at a Dr. Morton, 101 Flower Street. Where are you calling from? Simmons Book and Stationery Store. She works here. Well, will you get a description of the woman, please? Oh. I'll wait. Yes, of course, but don't, don't hang up. I found the young man again, and he told me what Sheila Mannix looked like. 
I got back to the phone and told the officer. Short, about five foot two, thin, possibly 90 pounds, wearing a brown coat with a brown shoulder strap bag. We'll try to find her, Miss Johnson. Now, please stay there. I'll have an officer come to the store to pick up the letter. I put the receiver on the hook and sat in the booth. You gotta admit, Paula Winslow's playing it just like Agnes Moorhead would have. Uh, May 15th, 1956, Suspense, the Death Parade on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion follows these messages from your favorite radio station. Thanks for tuning in. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better. Mike Lindell and MyPillow launching the MyPillow 2.0. Now, when Mike invented MyPillow, it had everything you could want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he's discovered a new technology that makes MyPillow even better. Of course, the patented adjustable fill of the original MyPillow, but now with brand new fabric with a temperature-regulating thread, it's the softest, smoothest, and coolest pillow you'll ever own. Say goodbye to tossing and turning and flipping your pillow over in the middle of the night. And more great news on the MyPillow 2.0. Buy one, get one free offer with my promo code Wyatt. MyPillow 2.0 is 100% made in the USA, 10-year warranty, 60-day money-back guarantee. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio podcast square to receive the MyPillow 2.0, buy one, get one free offer, use my promo code Wyatt, or call 1-800-928-4715. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, the conclusion of the Death Parade, starring Paula Winslow, an episode of Suspense, May 15th, 1956. I was shaking. My hands were wet. It was 11.20. Somewhere outside, I I heard a band playing. The parade must have started. I stayed in the shop, and the minutes passed. 11.30, 25 to 12. At 20 minutes, too, I... I just couldn't stand it any longer. The waiting, the awful waiting. I I had to do something. I called Sheila Mannix's house again. There was just that chance, that slight chance. Maybe she went home after the doctor. Maybe she's there. Oh, two more. No, 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 three. Let it go three more. Oh, be there. You must, you must. Hello? Oh, Miss Mannix. Who is this? Miss Mannix. You'll never know... Oh, listen, you don't know me. You have but... to speak louder. I can't hear a thing you're saying. Who, who is this? Miss Mannix? No, oh, Miss Mannix isn't here. This is the landlady. I'm cleaning up. Is oh. there a message? I couldn't stay in that store any longer. I gave the letter to the salesman and told him to give it to the police when they arrived. It was quarter to 12. Main Street was alive with people. It seemed as though the whole city had turned out to watch the parade. To me, it was the same parade of last year and all the years before. But today, there was a difference. Floats and the bright carriages meant nothing to me. I, I pushed my way along the street toward the intersection of Main and Thomas. I, I couldn't have stayed away if it were my own life depending on it. The crowd was so thick that it was impossible to see anything from the street, and I, I had to see. Then I, I thought of the Benson building and the roof. If I was up on the roof, I could see everything that happened on that corner. It was five to twelve when I got in the elevator and took it up to the nineteenth floor. I had to walk to the roof, and I. I could scarcely breathe as I opened the door and stepped out into the bright sun. Instinctively, I, I knew that this was the building. The same building that the man in the letter had been pushed from last year. For a minute, I, I didn't see anyone. And then, at the corner, standing near the edge, looking down, I saw her. A short woman, quite thin, dressed in a brown coat and a shoulder strap bag. Oh, Miss... Miss Mannix. You, you are Miss Mannix, aren't you? I, I've been looking for you. It's about a man called Jack. He's looking. Oh, it, it, it's, it's all right now. It, it's all right. Please, don't be frightened. Don't, don't move back. No, don't. The edge. No, don't. Oh, what's the matter? No, get, get away from there. Oh, no. No, he, Uh, 
And that's how it happened, huh? <laughs> yes, yes, I tried. You spend from 9 o'clock until 12 looking for, and you don't call us until 45 minutes before it happened. Well, I told you why. I you just You know something, Miss Johnson? I think you're lying. Lying? Why, how dare you say that? I... I was doing what I you thought was right. You picked up a letter, I... a warning letter, and you go to a janitor, you call people on the phone, but not the police. Well, I you was... You visit t- Sheila Mannix's house, you talk to the landlady, you talk to the neighborhood druggist, salesman of the bookstore, well, all witnesses, all alibis. I wanted to find and her And then you her. call the police when you're sure it's too late. Well, how did I know she'd be up there? How? Well, you've set up a mighty nice alibi for yourself. You were alone with Sheila Mannix. Now, who's to say you didn't push her? Oh, stop it. You, you don't know what you're talking about. You, you, you've no right to... I was trying to help her, that's all. I I won't listen to you. I'm, I'm going you home. You sit down, Miss Johnson. Now, go on, sit down. That's better. I'm, I'm holding you for a while. It's going to take more than a cock and bull story like that to get you out of this. We're going to check, Miss Johnson. We're going to do an awful lot of checking. I was a good citizen. I did my duty. I tried to save her, hey, and you, yeah. you would... Uh, can I see you for a minute? The... Yeah. Now, you just stay right there, Miss. We're not through yet. Oh, oh, murder. Oh, That's what they're saying. Great, I murdered. Great. You're saying that to me. Had it on the books. After all the Good's good, I was morning. only trying... Take a look at the report. Now, what are they saying? Well, it's about me. I know it. 28th precinct. Okay. I know well, it. Well, that does it, then. Well, Miss Johnson, we know what happened now. You know? What do you mean, you know? I told you. That's how it happened. Every now, I'll word. tell you something. I, I've got to believe you. There's nothing I can do about it. Nothing you can do? Well, what should you do? Instead of frightening the life out of me, you should... Now, will you listen to me for a change? Miss Johnson, I'd like nothing better than to throw the book at you, but I can't. We've got the man called Jack. He was picked up in the parade. There, there. That, I was right. The I fellow right. that wrote the letter you found figured Miss Mannix might have moved. He didn't know where, so this morning he called the police. He told them the story, and that's how we caught up. Well, then that... Then... Then she was safe. He... He couldn't have killed her. That's right. Well, why was she on the roof? Why did she go there? She... She wasn't in any danger then, was she? Oh, yes, she was, from you, because you found her and frightened her to death. I was only telling her that there was nothing to be afraid oh, of. Oh, sure, sure, that's all. Do you know she was standing in the same place where her boyfriend was killed a year ago? And then you come along and mention the name of the man that she knew killed him? Now maybe you know why she was afraid and backed away from you. You didn't do a thing. Well, I want you to know something. I want you to sleep with it for the rest of your life. If you just called the police when you picked up that letter, Sheila Mannix would be alive right now. Now, you think about that, huh? I... I can't see where I was wrong. Well, maybe I should have called sooner, but I, I did call. If, if you hadn't oh, taken... Oh, get out of here, will you? Get out, please, Miss Johnson. It, it's just too bad we can't send you where the other guy's going. He killed last year, you did it today, and just as sure as if you'd shot her. Now, go on, get out, Miss Johnson, please. <laughs> Well, it's all right, Lieutenant. I understand. I can see why you're upset. And I am sorry. I... I was only doing what I thought right. That's all. It wasn't my fault. It wasn't. If they'd got there sooner, it, it never would have happened. I... Nothing to reproach myself about. Nothing. Oh, dear, I'm so upset. Whole day's work. My gray silk dress ruined. They'll never be able to get that coffee stain out. Paula Winslow starred in tonight's presentation of The Death Parade. Next week, we bring you a story of a postmaster and his search for an unwelcome package. We call it Fragile Contents Death. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is transcribed in Hollywood by Anthony Ellis. Tonight's story was written by Shirley Gordon. The music was composed by Renee Garrigan and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Featured in the cast were Stacey Harris, Jack Crucian, Frank Gerstle, Clayton Post, George Walsh, Virginia Eiler, Howard McNear, Helen Cleave, and Jack Carroll.
May 15th, 1956, Suspense on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now let's jump into an episode of Blum and Abner, thanks to Ted at RadioMemories.com. This episode from May 15th, 1935, as Squire Skimp may be heading to Chicago with the Hogs. And now, let's see what's happening down in Pine Ridge. When Lum and Abner learned that it was unlawful to start a chain letter, they immediately began trying to get rid of the hogs they'd received from the hog chain letter they started last week. However, yesterday they learned that it was no offense to keep the hogs, and not much likelihood of their getting in trouble over the letters they started. So they are again enthusiastic over the results of their plan for farm relief. As we look in on Pine Ridge today, Lum is over at Abner's house counting the hogs they have received. And we find Abner and Grandpappy Spears down at the Jot'em Down store, apparently very busy. Listen. All right, Grandpap, it's your move. Well, I know it, I know it. Just give me time, quit rushing me. Well, you sat there for 20 minutes looking at that checkerboard. I'd have figured you'd forgot whose move it was. Wait a minute, how did you ever get that man clean down in here? Well, I jumped down there, taking two of your men when I done it, too. Well, I don't recollect seeing you doing that. Oh, well, uh, that was when you got up to wait on Sister Simpson a while ago, Grandpa. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's mighty funny to me every time I get up to wait on somebody, when I come back, you've jumped three or four of my men. I never jumped three or four, I jumped two. You weren't gone no time, hardly. Wait a minute here. You ain't accusing me of cheating, are you? I ain't accusing you of nothing. I just saying it's downright astonishing how much better you do when I ain't here to watch you. Yeah, well, that's all right then. Just recollect though who you're working for. I don't want no hard help accusing me of nothing. Unless they see me anyhow. Well, let's see here. Well, go on and move Summers. Well, I just move this gentleman here right up there. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I'll take this one and this one and right on in your kingdom. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> just move right back where you was. That don't count. I hadn't took my hand off it. Why, you had to. I never done no such a thing. I just moving it up there to see what would happen if I was to. Well, all right. If you don't want to play the game fair, well, just go ahead. Take it back. I just leave play with some young'un. Yeah, you do a heap better playing with some young'un, I'll say that. Here. Yeah, I'll move right over there. Now then. Well, let's see. I uh, dog it, I never seen that move. <laughs> yeah, that, that sort of changes things up. I, I'm feared that ruined me there. Yeah, believe as I ring after. Well, go ahead and answer it then. Oh, it's more than likely somebody won't you. Now you go yourself. ahead, Grandpap. It bothers me to have to get up when I'm concentrating this way. And blame it, I wish folks would quit bothering us. I had you beat till this happened. Hello? Oh, he got me there, so do I. Jot him down, store. Milford Spears talking. I thought I had this name till this happened. Well, I know he ain't here right now. He ought to be back, though, any minute. He just went over to Abner's place to count the hogs again. Count the hogs that they got in on their chain letter. Yeah, I guess what I do, I jump that and that and that right into his king row. Huh? <laughs> All right, Squire, I'll tell him yeah, when he comes in. <laughs> All right. Hey, come here, Grandpap. Look at here what I done. <laughs> What's the matter? Why, well, taking three of your men, I jumped clean into your king row. <laughs> I never seen it till you got up to answer the phone there. <laughs> Wait a minute here. I never seen no jump like that. No, no, that was a bad move you made, Grandpap, that last one. Yeah, well, the worst move I made is when I got up to answer the telephone. Now, just put them right back where you got them at. Well, I won't do no such a thing. I'm taking them three men fair and square, and I'm going to keep them. Oh, no, you don't. No, sir, you can't pull no such stunts as that on me. Give me them checkers. keep your hand off them checkers, Grandpap. Just get them off of there. Them belong to me. What's going on in here, anyway? Oh, uh, howdy, Lum. Yeah, sit down, Grandpa. I'll give them back. Don't say nothing. Sit down. I could hear you fellas arguing clean outside there. Just put that checkerboard up. You'd run a customer off. Be feared to come in here with all that rucus going on. Well, Grandpa was accusing me of cheating. Well, yeah. you was cheating. I got up to answer telephone while I was I up there talking on the I never taken a man that never belonged to me. Well, man. just hash up about it. I don't want to hear no more about it. There's plenty to do around here without you two sitting around playing checkers and arguing with one another. What's them groceries doing sitting there on the counter? Oh, why, uh, well, that's the order we put up a while ago. Uh, Bessie Gatlin called up for her. <laughs> yeah, that just reminds me, too, Grandpap. Uh, she said she's in a dreadful hurry for that stuff. <laughs> Forgot about that. Well, get it on over there, then, Grandpap. One, two, goodness, it's got to where if I want anything did right, I've got to do it myself. Yeah, get that on over there, Grandpap, like I told you. Now, you just keep your mouth out of this, Abner. 
I'll be back directly, Lom. Uh, by the way, Lom, Squire Skimp called up for you a while ago. Said he'd be over here to see you in a few minutes. I hate old Grandpa. All right, Grandpa. Hmm, reckon what Squire's want. I don't know. I never even knowed he called up. Oh, yeah, that must have been him calling a while ago. <laughs> I made such a good move. I'm glad he done it, too. <laughs> well, if he's coming over here to try to sell us something, I can tell him right now he's just wasting his time. Yeah. I've noticed we get along a heap better without him, Lom. Uh, did you get all the hogs counted? Well, no, but there ain't as many over there as I thought there was. There ain't? No, I figured we had seven or eight thousand. Look like there's that many. Why, yeah, I figured we had more than that. I never seen as many hogs in my life. Uh, that is, before I seen them. Of course, I, I've saw that many now. Well, trouble is, they move around so bad, a body can't hardly count them exact, but... Best way I could figure it, we've got to five and six thousand. I counted a thousand of them and then just sort of multiplied around, you know. Yeah, well, that's enough, for goodness sake. Yeah, that's a heap more than we need. The way they're going after that corn over there, we ain't going to be able to feed them long. Well, that corn ain't coming in as fast as the hogs did, Lom. No. I believe he's chain letters are sort of playing out now. Folks ain't taking the interest in them as they was there for a while. Well, the trouble with them corn chain letters, most everybody used all the corn they had to feed the hogs that got off the hog letter. Yeah, yeah, we ought to send the corn letter out first, I believe. Well, we'd better be figuring out something to do with them hogs. We can't afford to be buying feed for them. I believe that squire coming up the road yonder now, ain't it? Where? Way yeah. down there. Yeah, it looks like his wall. I reckon what he wants to see you about. Oh, I don't know. More than likely got something up his sleeve. Uh, I say he's got something up his sleeve. Uh, you mean a knife or something like that? A knife? Yeah, you know, this Blackie Masterson, he used to carry a knife up his sleeve all the time. Yeah, Squire ain't got no knife up his sleeve, I know that. Well, what is it then? He's a fur off, I don't see how you can tell what he's got. Oh, I, I mean he's got some kind of a trick up his sleeve. Oh, well, <laughs> and he won't put nothing over on us, hand, will he? No, I've got his number before he gets here. Oh, it's one of them number-guessing tricks, huh? Uh, well, tell me the number, Lum, so I'll know it, too. Tell you the number? Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, if that's a trick he's got up his sleeve, and you know the number, well, let me in on it, and then he can't pull it on neither one of them. I never said nothing about him having a number trick up his sleeve. Now, what kind of trick is it? I don't know, Abner. I ain't got the least idea what he wants. Yeah. It might be that and where they pull a rabbit out of a hat. No, oh, that's right, that's a hat instead of a sleeve. Let me see. I I've saw card tricks where they had cards up their sleeve. That's just about what it is, too. <laughs> yes, sir, that's what it Abner, is. Abner, <laughs> them ain't the kind of tricks I'm talking about. Well, I just can't wait to see what it is. <laughs> I do love good tricks. <laughs> I've always wanted to try that myself where they saw a woman in half, but I never could find nobody to <laughs> let me try it out on them. No, I don't blame them, neither. No, that's sort of serious if it don't work. Well, just hash up about the tricks. Here's Squire now. Yeah, we'll just make out like we don't know he's going to try to pull one on us, Lom. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see now that he's got something up his sleeve all right. <laughs> well, now, don't say nothing about him having nothing up his sleeve. Oh, no, no, I won't let on. Well, howdy, Squire. Yeah, come in, Squire. Well, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Been looking for you. Grandpap said you called up and said you'd be over. Yeah, go ahead and get started, Squire. Shut up, Abner. Well, I guess we may as well uh, get right down to business, man. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute now. Now, let me feel that sleeve first. <laughs> yeah, we're on you, Squire. You can't put nothing over on us. Abner, will you sit down there and hash up? Go ahead, Squire. Oh, well, uh, what I come over here to see you men about, I... Abner, turn Squire's arm loose. Just get away from him. Leave him alone. I couldn't feel a thing. Well, Mom. you better go over and be straightening up them shelves and put that checkerboard up. Dad, blame it. I want to watch that trick. Excuse Abner, Squire. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, Lom, I was talking to Ezra Zee's trunk a while ago, and he's got about 400 head of hogs over at his place uh, that he got from that, uh, that chain letter that's been circulating around here. Well, we've got ten times that many. We've got over 5,000 of the things. Yes, yes, I understand that you have. And there's quite a few folks around here that's got more than they can take care of. And I've been to talking to some of them. If we can get this whole bunch to go in together, well, I'll make a trip into Kansas City and uh, Chicago and one or two other stock market centers, and we can dispose of these hogs for you at a good price, Lum. Now, the way I had it figured out... If you men will give me 10% of what the hogs bring, 
I'll handle the whole thing and get you a much better price than you could get yourself trying to dispose of them. Uh, Granny, that's a sound all right, Squire. Well, uh, of course, I just figured, Lum, on account of us being such old friends, if I could help you men out, I'd be glad to do it. Well, we wondered how long it'd be before Squire Skimp muscled in on this deal. This is Carlton Brickert speaking for Lum and Abner and Horlicks, who now bid you all good night and good health. Squires getting in on the deal, but uh, going in together like that might be a good thing. Then again, it might be a bad thing. May 15th, 1935, Lum and Abner here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Visit Ted at radiomemories.com, who restored and supplied us these shows to bring you here on Classic Radio Theater. Radiomemories.com. He supplies shows on cassette, CD, or flash drive for your computer. Radiomemories.com Our webpage is classicradio.stream. Stream our shows. Learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can contact me, find our social media links, and uh, you can find a list of places there where all of our uh, uh, podcasts are available via download. And you can also buy me a coffee. The buy me a coffee money helps us acquire additional classic radio collections and helps us maintain our distribution channels. That's at classicradio.stream. Classicradio.stream. Thanks for tuning in. Tell all your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. <laughs>